Hello, ladies, probably 5% of you, and gentlemen. So I'm Marcello, I break stuff, aka divide by zero, and today I'm gonna talk about storage proofs and make some announcements and drop some alpha. So let's get started. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's talk about what we actually do. So I like to say that we unify space and time. So let's talk about the temporal dimension first. So I like to think of Ethereum and blockchains, generally speaking, especially stateful blockchains, as just a database where everything can be represented as a table. And this table basically has, has three columns nowadays. So the contract address, for example, die or like whatever, some storage key and some value. And this works fine, but something is missing and it's pretty putting a lot of constraints on the type of applications we can build. And what if this table was like that, where you can just say, hey, I want this from this contract at this point in time. It's as simple as that. Nowadays, we cannot really do that on any smart contract enabled blockchain. And that's exactly how storage proofs can come in. So that's about the temporal dimension. I think that's pretty much it. So now let's talk about time, uh, sorry, space. So our opinion is that Ethereum nowadays is sharded for a very good reason, because this table that I just shown you, the one before, got really, really, really big. So maintaining this table becomes actually a hard task. So it's, uh, as in any like, system, when we need to scale it, we usually scale it horizontally. And it's very similar in the case of Ethereum. And that's why we have like multiple places where we actually execute, store data, operate on the data, and so on. And we feel like this should be unified, and that's exactly what we want to do. So now coming back to my analogy of like tables and databases, you know, when you use like a database, you don't really want to know that something is stored in another partition or one partition. And ideally you just make a query and you have the data and you should not really care where this data is located, why it's there, how you, what workflow needs to be executed to like access it. And that's exactly how storage proofs not really work, but what they enable. So now let's talk quickly about storage proofs. All right, so let's start from the basics. I'm gonna now talk, about, now I'm gonna talk about the definition of a roll-up node, so, sorry, just about like blockchains. So if you think of it, a block hash is a commitment to basically the full history of a blockchain. And that said, if you have enough computational power and enough bandwidth, you can do quite a lot of things. So one thing is first, you can actually prove that you know the pre-image to this hash, which is nothing else than the block header. Then from the block header, you can access the parent hash, prove that you know the pre-image to this hash, and keep repeating this process over and over again until you reach that, hey, this is the actual hash of the genesis. You can do it. But block headers have another properties, like for example, state roots. So let's, let me move to the next slide. Actually, they have three roots, which we should care about. State root, receipt root, transaction root. And these hashes are just a root of a Merkle tree, more precisely a Merkle Patricia tree, but not, that's not important for the purpose of this talk. Um, and the idea is that as Merkle trees, as in Merkle trees, you can commit to some information, some da data set, and we can also prove the inclusion of some specific leaves in that tree. And it works exactly the same. Basically, we got this table in Ethereum, we flash it to this tree, and again, if we have enough computational power, aka we can verify this Merkle inclusion proof, and enough bandwidth, so we can actually give and upload somewhere this proof, we can access the information. And now if you think of it, what primitives gives us a lot of computational power and a lot of bandwidth? The answer is ZK snarks and ZK starks. Why? Because we have succinctness and also we can perform the proving off-chain. We don't need to have this like redundant amount of work performed by multiple validators sparse across the world. No, we can just do it on one machine, just prove it and verify the proof. As simple as that. So that's the TLDR about storage proof and how this works. And now probably most important disclaimer, this proof can also be verified on-chain. So if I can prove that some piece of data is somewhere, I can consume this data and do something with it. Cool. So that sounds like one of the cool things, but it has a problem. And the problem is that basically, as in any 
proof-based system, we need to actually generate the proof, so we need to deal with the fact that, hey, prover, please get me that proof, then you have the proof, then you need to like do something with the proof on the UI when you're building your application, you need to upload it somewhere, so you need to change your smart contracts, you need to add like, a new additional parameter to your function, then you need to call a contract, and now the question is where you get the proof from, ideally an API, and that's what we provide, but we can do better. And that's what the announcement today is about. And now I want to move on to Turbo. So what you see here is some code, pseudocode, I don't really know, yeah, pseudocode. And this is called Turbo. And the idea is that now you can write smart contracts, on-chain, Solidity, Cairo, whatever you want. Uh, as simply as that, you can finally think of Ethereum as just a database. You can say, hey, I am on StarkNet, I want to access my balance on mainnet, and I want to read the variable of, of course, balance off. I provide a chain ID, a target block, the address of the contract, in this case, die, and that's it. And I can now do some computation with it, like invoke another contract. So the idea is that on the left side, you just define the data, and on the right side, you just call Herodotus. It's as simple as that. No off-chain calls, no attaching proofs. It's basically like making an S load. And this is what we call Turbo. So that might sound like magic, so let me explain how it actually works. So let's get to the flow. In order to design Turbo, we took a step back and we thought, what is the actual life cycle of a transaction in any, any blockchain? And basically we had this crazy idea of maybe, hmm, what if we attach our system directly in the um, supply chain of building a block? And our design is as follows. We have um, some actor who is going to monitor constantly the mempool or is going to receive the transactions directly. And here, whenever I mention transactions, I mean transactions that actually call these contracts that are going to interact with, uh, with Turbo and essentially perform this. By the way, this, again, is on-chain. Next step, we see that such a transaction actually is in the mempool and we need to do something, so we start generating the proofs. Now, keep in mind the proof is, uh, the, the transaction is still, is still not included. We generate all the proofs, and then what do we do with these proofs? Of course, we need to verify them. And what is the verification? The verification is another transaction. So you might be wondering, okay, so, but like, how is it possible that here I do everything synchronously? It means that in line, blood, die, balance on mainnet, I need to load it from somewhere, right? But this is not set, and how do we make sure that the data is actually there? And this is what this diagram is about. So we introduced a concept of a swap. For those of you who are familiar with um, Unix, there is basically this idea that if you run out of memory, or you need some memory with memory segments with like specific properties, you can actually emulate it. And here we have this a similar idea that basically we created a dedicated contract on-chain where you can write to it anything under one condition that whatever you write to it needs to be actually authenticated by storage proofs. So you can, for example, write, again, like a balance, a property from a block header, some receipt, whatever. So then the transaction sent actually by the user gets in. Before that, we make sure that the transaction sent by the prover that actually writes the values in the swap is included first, and then once everything is done and the data was actually read, we just remove this information because we don't need it anymore. So we basically introduced like a concept of like a transient storage, um, and that's it. So now other steps, of course, you know, generating proofs and running this infrastructure obviously is not an easy task. And all of these actors that actually put the work in doing that should be incentivized. So actual users who want to interact and are willing to interact with such applications need to like anticipate for that. So there is a, some, some fee component. And that will uh, lead me to the next part of this presentation. So now let's just talk about like the dynamics and what is actually the flow of value in this, um, uh, in this design. So I like to think about this type of transactions as something made of two components. So first off, it's block space. Block space because obviously I have some willingness to talk to some smart contract, so I need 
some space in the block to put my transaction inside. And then also I introduce a new dimension, which is I want to perform this specific reads. So let's talk about the reads now. So in order to perform these reads, we need to actually prove them. And to prove them, we need to perform all these authenticated reads from the original data structure, which is a Merkle Patricia tree, like the chain of blocks, whatever that is. And depending on where the proof are gonna be verified, we need to either like put some layer of recursion, never mind, like doesn't really matter, but basically there is some work to do. And finally, there's also some infrastructure cost because we need to constantly monitor, we need to like batch things together. Of course, we need to write to the swap, which is another transaction. So yeah, there's also the swap management uh, cost, which again requires block space. As it requires block space, we are gonna spend gas on it. And then there is a small remainder, which is basically the revenue for the, for the prover. So now if you think of it, the, these two components, proving cost and infrastructure cost, can be broken down basically to the AWS bill. And then we have a component which is the gas fees, because in order to you know, provide this enriched block space, we also need normal block space. So now let's talk about uh, how we actually constructed the system and how we make sure that it's not centralized and only one prover can operate uh, within the system. So we came up with this design where in order to have the right to fulfill this intent, you need to participate in an auction and the auction is, hey, uh, I, as a prover, want to basically handle the transaction flow between this block and this block. So obviously slot can be of some predefined left, for example, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 100 blocks, whatever that is, the number is not fixed yet. Um, and now the, um, the equation that kind of defines this dynamics is the following. So first off, we need to win the bid. So this is the first cost that the prover is gonna incur. The next cost is obviously infrastructure, proving, and so on. And finally, we have some income uh, that comes from actually serving these transactions. So now if you think of it, if my overall cost, which is a sum of the, um, the bid and the infrastructure cost is below the actual income, it means that I made some money. So here it means that I can optimize something. So if I'm able to optimize, for example, the infrastructure cost by performing correctly batching, all the optimizations, choosing the right prover and so on, it means that I can lower this cost down. If I can lower this cost down, if the, this market is so competitive, I'm able to bid more. So basically in this mechanism, basically the best prover should always win. But if the prover is outbidding, then he's gonna lose money, so he's directly disincentivized to participate in the protocol. And if he de denies to generate all these proofs, it's just gonna cost him money, right? Because it's attack on the, an attack on the, on the system, and why would you do that? It's just gonna cost you. Um, so that's about this. And now you might be wondering, what actually happens with this, this beats? And here we want to introduce uh, a build program. And uh, we strongly bet on innovation and like we believe that storage proofs like enable this new dimensions that will finally allow us to think of Ethereum as just a proper database. Um, and we want you to experiment with this. And obviously we want to basically share our success with you. And yeah, that's why all of these fees and will be basically redistributed to the developers who actually um, build these applications. So that's about the announcement, I think. And that's it, and now time for questions.